Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, depending on where you might be watching from or listening to from. This is our final webinar in our True Africa University MIT series on sustainable development in Africa. We started on March 4th, and every Thursday since March 4th, we have had a presentation, a discussion, a conversation with a person who we consider to be shaping the future of Africa in various ways. We've discussed creative industries, we've discussed energy, we've discussed entrepreneurship, we've discussed geopolitics. And this week we are discussing um, a topic which ends up being topic A in a lot of African countries when you actually travel to Africa. And the overall arching topic is Africa's progress towards democracy. And we will be focusing specifically on South Africa, even though in the conversation part of the webinar, the second part, we will obviously widen the discussion and broaden it to other African countries outside of Africa. We have a very, very special and knowledgeable and, and informed uh, speaker today, Evan Lieberman, is the professor, uh, the total professor of political science and contemporary Africa at MIT. He conducts research in the field of comparative politics and his focus is on uh, development issues and really ethnic conflict in Sub-Saharan Africa. He's the author of Boundaries of Contagion, How Ethnic Politics Have Shaped Government Responses to AIDS and Race and Regionalism in the Politics of Taxation in Brazil and South Africa. Again, South Africa is a country that he focuses on in his research and often in his teaching. Uh, Professor Evan Lieberman was a Fulbright Fellow in South Africa in 1997-1998, which were really important years in the post-apartheid. And he was also a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Scholar at Yale University in 2000 and 2002, where he actually worked with one of our past speakers on these webinar series, Professor Leonard Wanchikon, uh, from Princeton University. Previously, Professor Lieberman was a professor and associate chair in that Department of Politics at Princeton from 2002 to 2014. Uh, well, I'm gonna move to myself now. I'm Claude Granitsky. I'm the founder of Trace and True Africa, which are two media companies that have been championing the creativity of African youth. That's what we focus on is African youth culture and the potential of African youth. I'm a graduate of London University at MIT, where I received an MBA as a Sloan Fellow. And I'm launching True Africa University because I want to find actionable ways to nurture African talent. So this is what this whole series is about, is the potential of African talent and how do we make the most of harnessing that talent. Now, this series was brought to us by uh, True Africa University in partnership with the MIT Center for International Studies, CIS, as, as we all call it, because I'm also a research affiliate there, CIS aims to support and promote international research and education at MIT. We produce research that creatively addresses global issues while helping to educate the next generation of global citizens. Visit cis.mit.edu to learn more. And the MIT Africa program, which is our other partner and one of the major catalysts for everything we're doing around this webinar series, is based at MIT CIS. The MIT Africa program empowers MIT students and faculty to advance knowledge and solve the world's great challenges by connecting them with leading researchers, companies, and other partners in African countries. For more information, visit misti.mit.edu. That's misti.mit.edu. It turns out that Professor Lieberman has been very involved with the MIT Africa project, and we will get to some of those specifics a bit later. Now, True Africa University aims to become a Pan-African learning community, and we are committed to accelerating Africa's sustainable development by mobilizing a global network of academic, industrial, and institutional partners. With that intro, I will leave the mic to Professor Evan Lieberman. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. We have a lot to discuss regarding South Africa and the broader continent today. The mic is yours. Uh, great. Thanks, Claude. Thanks uh, for that great introduction. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. I'm really uh, 
honored to be included in this terrific lineup that uh, Claude's arranged over the past few months. I really enjoyed uh, attending all of these, these sessions. Um, and as he mentioned, I'm going to talk about government in, in Africa. Um, and I'm ultimately going to discuss what might be desirable for the future. And hopefully this will be the basis for some discussion with all of you. But first, I want to consider how government has performed in the past um, and what we observe in the present. And I'm going to focus, as Claude said, on the South African case but I think there really are lessons and implications for lots of other African countries. And let me preview my argument by saying, I think that there's much more good news in Africa than is commonly appreciated. Um, and I think that sustainable development would be better served by in many ways consolidating what currently exists in South Africa and several other democratic countries on the continent than by proposing massive ruptures in terms of how citizens are governed. Um, but first, let me say something about myself. Um, unlike most of the guests in this series, you, you may have guessed that I am neither an African national nor part of the African uh, diaspora, but I do have a longstanding connection to the continent. Um, I'm, I'm coming up on my own 30th anniversary. I, I traveled there for the, for the first time in 1991 as a college student, um, and I figured I needed in this picture to indicate which one was me. I don't exactly look the same as I did then. Um, but we had the great fortune of sharing a flight delay with Nelson Mandela on the way from Joburg to Cape Town. And that entire trip, you know, in many ways shaped what I would do all the way to the present. Um, and uh, as part of my own inspiration for being involved in, in MIT Africa, because I think that what you know, students do at a young age can really shape them for, for a long time. Um, but my research and teachings extended to other parts of the continent. Um, and I've retained this really strong interest in South Africa and a little over two years ago, the country marked the 25th anniversary of Nelson Mandela's election as president. Um, and I use that milestone as an occasion to reflect on the history of the country. And I'm just now finishing up a book about what, what democracies delivered. So, you know, if we look back as recently as 1989, you know, there just, there wasn't too much in the way of democracy on the African continent indicated here from the varieties of democracy project um, with with uh, uh, strength of democracy indicated. Oh, sorry, hang on a minute. I, I forgot We're to not seeing the slides. Screen. Yeah, you need to see uh, those screens and particularly that photo of you that. With, with Nelson Mandela. All right, I think I need we to, need to I go need back to, to that. There we go. So sorry about that. Um, so so there's there's me and and uh, there's there's Nelson Mandela. So uh, uh, you know maybe you didn't need the, the indications to pick which one was which, but, but there you go. Are you seeing those now, Claude? Yes, we are. <laughs> we had to start strong. All right, thanks. So, so as I was saying, you know, um, 1989, there wasn't too much in the way of democracy on the African continent. Um, you still had white rule in South Africa. You had a lot of wars, a lot of di dictators, and the Cold War was still raging. But by the early 1990s, that was a time of real democratization for much of the African continent and other parts of the world. And much of the story I wanna tell about South Africa also resonates with the record of other democratic countries in Africa, including Botswana, Namibia, Ghana, Benin, Senegal, Mauritius, and others. And I'm gonna focus on South Africa because it's the country I know well with all this history. It's an important case in political and economic terms both on the African continent and on the global stage. And this graph shows the very stark political rupture of 1994. But for those of you who follow the news in South Africa, I think you'll agree that over the past several years, the news and the commentary out of that country seems more bad than good, right? And some will say that it's a model of what Africa should not be. And several authors have been using the metaphor of a precipice to describe where the country's landed. For example, the South African sociologist Olela Mangtu published a book on the state of democracy in South Africa and concluded that things were to the brink. And then Alex Brain, another South African who founded the very famous Institute for Democracy in South Africa, and he was the vice chairperson of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, along with Desmond Tutu, wrote this book recently, What's Gone Wrong? South Africa on the Brink of Failed Statehood. And the Zambian economist Mbisa Moyo published this book, Edge of Chaos, Why Democracy is Failing to Deliver Economic Growth. And she begins that book by highlighting what she describes as the failures in South Africa. And there's many others, 
And I could go on and on, but you know, I think you get it. I think the conventional wisdom on South Africa, particularly from South Africans, is that it's a mess, that Mandela would be rolling in his grave and that the country is on the verge of something awful. And on many of my past trips to South Africa, friends and acquaintances across the color bar have said to me, you know what this country needs? A benevolent dictator. Or relatedly, if only South Africa, or if only Africa could be more like China. In fact, one of the, the earlier guests in this series, the well-known economist, Jeff Sachs, showed us a graph that kind of looked like this one, it's using similar data on economic growth, reminding us of the incredible economic growth rates achieved in China, especially on a per capita basis, and compared this to the relatively paltry growth in Africa overall, and then I've added here uh, the South African case. And no doubt, you know, the picture is a bit sobering and we shouldn't hide from it. But you know, there's also no hiding from the fact that if we say, be more like China, a big part of that connotes authoritarian rule with little in the way of civil liberties. And of course, being authoritarian is no guarantee of rapid economic growth. And in fact, my MIT colleague, the economist, Daron Asimoglu, will tell you that growth actually tends to be higher on average in democracies than in non-democracies. So let's return to the main question of what's been the value of democracy and should that be the future for South Africa and for the rest of the continent? Or should the democratic countries be contemplating a more Chinese style approach or looking to a country like Rwanda for guidance? And to answer that, I think we need a bit of historical perspective on what it was like in the period before democracy. And I came of age in the tail end of the anti-apartheid movement. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, much of the world was rallying behind the idea that apartheid must end and that a multiracial democracy must replace it. And at that time, South Africa was truly the scourge of the world, right? Here in the United States today, we're clearly still reckoning with our own ugly history on race relations but the South African system of institutionalized white supremacy was far, far more thoroughgoing and a white minority brutally oppressed a black majority for three and a half centuries. And of course, I'm not gonna go through all that history right now, but I think it's fair to say that by the late eighties and early nineties, South Africa was fully mired in various forms of violent conflict. The white government declared a state of emergency and various liberation movements were at war both with the government and sometimes with one another. And on just about every dimension, the country I think was poised for failure, right? And again, I wanna highlight all of this because sometimes the problems we see in South Africa today are discussed as if they were created by recent governments. But the legacies of profound indignities are pretty deep. Under white government, the majority black population received horrible schooling. A generation was essentially uneducated, had few, school, had few skills and were schooled principally in protest. Income and wealth disparities extraordinary and most blacks deprived of the basic services that virtually all whites could take for granted. Families were broken owing to a migrant labor system with men working and living far from home in mines and quite relatedly, this helped fuel a massive AIDS epidemic. And protest strategies involved making the country ungovernable. And to be in South Africa in the early 1990s, you never knew where a bomb might go off. And on that trip, the picture which I, I showed you at the start, every building I entered involved going through a metal detector. Right? So it was an astoundingly violent pace, place. And it's from that important perspective that I think things turned out pretty well. Right. First off, the country developed a pretty robust democracy by any standard. And in so many ways, people's lives improved. And citizen influence has helped to drive better outcomes in terms of material conditions, keeping government leaders accountable, and extending human dignity. Now, for sure, it's a work in progress. But South African democracy is just over 25 years old. And look at all the challenges we continue to face here in the United States now more than 50 years after the passage of our Civil Rights Act, which was kind of our post-apartheid movement. 
So of course, you know, the election of Nelson Mandela in 1994 was an historic moment, but the country has now hosted a total of six free and fair national elections and five free and fair local elections. And arguably those have been more widely accepted as legitimate than what we've seen in several American elections in recent years. Um, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying that our elections were illegitimate, but I'm talking about how, how citizens have, have viewed them. And President Ramaphosa in South Africa just announced that the next local election will take place in October, but I think that still depends on the state of COVID. And while it's true that the African National Congress has been dominant, its political control has been seriously challenged as you can see here. So I've plotted the ANC vote shares in national elections on the left and ANC vote shares in local elections on the right. And I, and I point this out because despite the warnings of many South African political scientists that the country was gonna resemble the kind of one party state that characterized Mexico for almost the entire 20th century, you can see that the once dominant ANC has been really losing ground at both levels. And I think this is good news, right? Because South African politics has clearly become more competitive and political elites face more pressures than ever to respond to the wants and needs of citizens. Also, there's a really rich and open media environment, right? The country's home to thousands of newspapers, radio signals reach virtually every household in the country, internet penetration is high and growing. It's true that access to information remains pretty unequal by place and by class, which also employ, it implies usually also by race but journalistic freedom and the flow of information is extremely high. And frankly, we just can't take such things for granted anymore with so many government leaders in Africa and elsewhere curbing press freedoms. Each and every day, the problems of government are reported loudly. Third, the judiciary operates with integrity. In fact, one of the more remarkable things I found in my research is how deep the roots of the human rights tradition are within the ANC from as early as the early 20th century to the creation of this important document on the left, the Freedom Charter, which was launched in 1955. And it advanced a set of key goals defining what liberation would look like. And these you know, really formed the basis for the 1993 interim constitution and 1996 final constitutions in South Africa. And frankly, both the South African and the Kenyan constitutions are today considered among the most progressive and sophisticated in the world. And in both countries, there's really a very strong and deep bench of world-class judges working to protect these important rights and to build the rule of law. So not only is South Africa rich on the basic institutions of democracy, but I'd argue that it's an engaged democracy and there's no shortage of discussion, deliberation, and still a very active civil society. Now, some of the critics might grant, all right, you know, from an institutional and engagement perspective, South Africa is a democracy, but they're concerned that democratic politics is failing to deliver better lives to citizens. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, many have, have highlighted that economic growth in South Africa has been pretty lackluster. Um, the economy is not generating enough new jobs. And that's certainly true. Growth rates have hovered around 1% in the past few years, which just isn't enough to create the millions of jobs needed. But beyond economic growth, I think the big question is the extent to which the democratic government has delivered on the ANC's original promise to provide a better life, especially to those who had been previously disadvantaged under apartheid. And the truth is there's been remarkable progress during the democratic era, right? In many ways, life is much better. 1996, 44% of households had access to pipe water. And by 2016, 84% had access. 96, 58% of households had electricity connections. And by 2016, over 90% had access. 32% of people were living below the severe poverty line in the late 1990s. And by the early part of this decade, this had fallen to 18%. Finally, in 1996, 58% of households were in formal dwellings. And by 2016, it was up to 
So by international standards, these are all pretty incredible achievements. And I'm not even mentioning here, well, actually I'll, I'll mention it right now, the incredible accomplishments in terms of empowering women with huge gains in representation, providing equal rights for LGBTQs and for people with disabilities and for advancing social justice in so many ways that were simply unthinkable under the apartheid government. Now, of course, there've been problems, right? Perhaps the most well-known and most monumental of policy mistakes in the post-apartheid government was its failings in addressing HIV AIDS. And to a degree, bad policy really contributed to the rapid spread of HIV. And this was devastating. I spent many years trying to understand the really bad policies, not just of Thabo and Becky, but even of Nelson Mandela. But the truth is many countries had bad HIV policies and some of it is quite reminiscent of what we've been observing around COVID. But for me, the real demonstration of South Africa's success with democracy are the episodes of corrections of bad leaders um, and of bad policies. And in the case of AIDS policy, South Africa really reversed course. And in this case, a very active civil society and news media and judiciary all put enormous pressure on the government to change course. And this resulted in a very different approach, right? South Africa went from being a denialist country under Thabo Mbeki to now hosting the most expansive treatment program in the world. They went from having less than 1% of those who needed ARVs being on treatment in 2000 to over 60% today. And if we look back again, the pundits predicted that South Africa with its bad AIDS policies was going to completely implode. And it didn't. An active civil society, which was free to pressure and to shame the government contributed to a new policy regime. Another example, much of the reason that South African democracy has been so maligned in recent years is this one particular president, Jacob Zuma. He was one of five post-apartheid presidents. I'm certainly not gonna doubt that he was an awful leader. But again, I think that democracy proved to be self-correcting among many dimensions. One stunning example that reverberated in global markets was Zuma's firing of a highly respected finance minister in December of 2015, when he replaced him with a little known political ally. And the business community, the media and others pushed back hard against this attempt to install an inexperienced crony to a truly crucial job. Within a week, Zuma bowed to the pressure, removed his crony and replaced him with someone good and well-respected. There's no doubt that Zuma engaged in quite a bit of corruption. And shortly after his election in 2009, he authorized spending of millions of dollars of taxpayer money on improvements to his personal homestead in Kanla. And one could say that such corruption is evidence democracies failed. But I say it's amazing that we know about it, right? Investigative journalists broke the story later that year and by 2014, the National Public Protector successfully took him to court and ordered him to repay more than a half a million dollars, a verdict which he accepted. And there are very, very few places anywhere where the rule of law functions that well. And the findings revealed him to be a bad president, which led to movements to bring him down. Now, for sure, various prosecutors are still trying to hold him and others in the ANC accountable. And you know, news of this is coming out each day and citizens will say it's insufficient. Fair enough. But I'll say that Zuma is being held accountable far more than what we've seen here in the United States for corrupt action, um, let alone for the levels of impunity afforded to corrupt leaders in countries like China. And there are other examples about corrections in education policy around water management and so on. And I continue to be impressed that when there are problems, South Africans are the first to speak up, to initiate a dialogue, and that often brings change. And that to me is what democracy is all about. So when people say to me, you know, what Africa needs is a benevolent dictator that can produce growth like China's, I say, you know, societies can choose or tolerate dictators, but you don't know ahead of time how benevolent they're gonna be, right? And sadly, the history of the African continent is filled with dictators that have done huge harms to their societies. And I'm sure you recognize some of the pictures that I've put on the screen here. 
And I think that Africans, including South Africans, want a dignified existence. And part of that is making choices and not being told what to do. So today, life is very, very far from perfect in South Africa. There are big problems, big worries about violence, corruption, poverty, disease, xenophobia, slow economic growth, poor education, and lack of jobs. These are serious. There's no doubt about it. And I'm not discounting them. But I think it's a vast overstatement to describe the entire political system as corrupt or to say there's been no progress in addressing poverty or enhancing dignity. And political competition in South Africa can be ferocious at times, but I do think it helps to drive accountability. So what does South Africa need and what's the, the model for the rest of Africa? I think that the best of available bets is to strengthen existing democratic institutions. In still young democracies, when people are dissatisfied or frustrated, it's tempting to try to change the rules of the game. But honestly, I think that some of the choices about what are the best institutions are less consequential than the choice to commit to those institutions to instill predictability. For instance, in South Africa today, some citizens and some opposition leaders have been pushing to change the electoral system to directly elect leaders rather than continuing on with the parliamentary system they currently have. But I'd say, you know, again, drawing on the American experience, there's, there's plenty of problems with presidential systems too. And every attempt to change the system comes at the risk of losing trust and credibility and contributes to the notion that losers will just change the rules or that the winners will try and change the rules to keep themselves in power. And the very notion of strong institutions, which Leonard Wachikin talked about uh, the other week, is that the rules stay the same. And this is why term limits are so important, right? Democracy involves transfers of power, not dictatorship. And unfortunately, this has been a big problem in much of Africa, and we've seen just too many cases of democratically elected leaders seeking to change the constitution during their second term to allow for other, other terms in office. So I think you know, promoting constitutionalism and the rule of law through the courts are just critical. Claude had asked me to talk about e-government um, how are we doing on, on time, Claude? Do I have another two minutes or, or do you want me to- well, Yeah, right? yeah you, you have another five minutes. Okay, great. So, you know, Claude had asked me to talk about uh, e-government. Um, and, and let me say this, you know, there are examples of digital governance going really well. And there are examples of real problems, right? It promises great efficiencies. Um, and with blockchain, for example, there's a you know, great opportunities to have greater levels of accountability um, and to deter stealing. But when I think about the examples on the continent in South Africa and elsewhere, you know, for instance, uh, uh, using digital voting in Kenya or trying to move to an e-government system of social grants in South Africa, you know, there's also important examples of e-governance not working. Just as AI has introduced new biases in government systems in various countries, um, including the United States, we shouldn't think that e-government or AI are necessarily gonna work best for equitable, sustainable development, not, not on their own. This work needs to be done very carefully and alongside the development of a government that people fundamentally trust. So, you know, I'm happy to discuss this more. I think it's a really important topic, clearly, more digital government is going to be part of Africa's future, but it's no replacement for the hard work of getting a, a trustworthy, incredible democratic government. Now, you might ask, how do we get these great outcomes? Um, and I wish I had an easy answer. I, I think, though, and maybe this is the point of my talk, the starting point is to value them, to recognize that the hard work of democratic governance is actually worth it to change norms and values by not, by not accepting special contracts and favors, especially for those with friends and family members in government offices. And I think here, in the, a lot of the, the seminars talked about Africa's growing business elite. They play a really important role, right? They, they can coordinate around transparency and refusing to participate in corrupt schemes when offered to them. You know, it, it's not easy. As an American, I humbly admit that our system remains 
deeply flawed and unequal. But democracy, I think, is still the best option we have out there, and we need more of it, not less. Um, so why don't I why don't I end there? Well, this is a great place to end because it's actually also a great place to begin, Evan. Thank you so much for this. Um, you know, what I, again, I, I, I was really deliberate about inviting a few optimists to this webinar series, and, and you're definitely in the optimist category in the way that Leonard Wachikon is, in the way that uh, Jeffrey Sachs is, um, because, you know, the demonstration, um, you know, the, 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 what you've just demonstrated now really is that it's time to redouble our faith in democratic institutions and, and look at what's working versus focusing, as the media always does, on what's not working. However, I wanna go back to uh, the specific example of, of Jacob Zuma because he was such a divisive uh, ruler in South Africa. You know, you, you did call him as, as most other people did an awful leader. Um, and, and, and you said it was important, you know, for the next generation of leaders, not necessarily to accept favors or participate in corrupt schemes. Uh, but if, if we look at just Zuma, for instance, uh, because of his, um, his political weight, you know, he's a true heavyweight, still in, in South African politics in some ways. And, you know, literally, I think it was a couple of weeks ago that, you know, his entire um, legal team quit. And this is, you know, just, I think he's supposed to go on trial this month. And this guy's been charged or is, is being tried on, on 16 charges of racketeering, fraud, corruption, money laundering, you know, all kinds of things. You know, you mentioned the example of his house. So I guess my first question um, is, how is it that, those kinds of leaders can become kind of dominant forces in, uh, in countries that are on the path towards kind of true democratic uh, rule? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's one uh, uh, that, I, that I wrestle with. If you look back, I mean, it, on the one hand, Zuma had great liberation credentials, right? He was a hardworking, charismatic member of the anti-apartheid resistance. Um, he, he was a real contrast in style to Thabo Mbeki, who, you know, th there was a kind of caretaker president in between the two of them. But, you know, Thabo Mbeki was a, you know, kind of, uh, university educated, you know, kind of intellectual lead who had big ideas about the African Renaissance and things like that. And, you know, I, of course, sat there thinking, oh, this is great. You know, I love this. Um, you know, Zuma really presented himself as a stark contrast, as a man of the people, you know, that he got his education, you know, through, through life. And he was appealing in, in lots of different ways. Um, and, but, but, you know, there was the reality that he was already implicated in some corruption scandals. He had already said some ridiculous things, uh, as, as, as many of the, the audience and maybe you were aware of, um, even on the topic of AIDS, um, you know, he had, he had uh, slept with a woman who was HIV positive and said that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a concern because she took a shower, which was ridiculous. Now all this was in the was in the news. Um, you know, I, I, it's it's hard to know what goes on in the heads of leaders. And all I can say is to in, excuse me in the, in the heads of citizens when they make votes. There's lots of information that we have, and here in the United States, a lot of the information people had about Donald Trump. It was surprising that they would vote for him. So it's not a it's not a great answer. Um, but that but. But the counterpart, I think, would be: imagine if you didn't have a democratic system and South Africa was still stuck with Zuma forever. That would be the alternative, right? And then there, there might be an alternative because you know I've been going to South Africa, you know, almost as long as you have, and I've been reporting from South Africa. And a lot of my younger South African friends are just saying, you know what? Enough with this ANC. You know, they're actually being more and more tempted by. Julius Malema and his whole movement around what he calls economic freedom fighters, right? I think he calls himself the commander in chief of the economic freedom fighters. They're like, you know what? You know, all these leaders, whether it's Becky, Jacob Zuma, they've all let us down. Maybe it's time to go for something more radical that will be about actually 
um, what you, you know, delivering better lives to citizens to use, um, you know, one of your expressions, you know, how do you feel about this kind of temptation towards more radical politics, more grassroots politics of, um, of, of younger activists turned politicians like Ajula Salema, who I think he's only 40 years old and he has been very relevant for the past decade. Look, Malema is absolutely, uh, you know, he's been, a, been a, a game changer in terms of exciting the, the, the generation of born freeze and young people in South Africa in general. And I think he's put a lot of interesting and exciting ideas on the table. Um, and I think that, that it, it's terrific to have him in the political discourse and to be challenging the, the ANC um, and, and the other parties to think more broadly about fairness, about issues like land. You know, I think that that land redistribution has been, you know, woefully underappreciated and, 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 and not well addressed in South Africa. Um, but I, you know, I also think that one of the things that we've seen is that the, the EFF at, at local government, what's been really interesting about South Africa is is how important local government has become over the past several years. Um, I think that the EFF's role has been, um, they've been good at cajoling, but in, in actually, you know, helping to govern and making kind of concrete policies and sticking to them. Um, you know, it's not like they've, they, they haven't been in power, but they've been in coalition governments. I haven't seen, you know, great evidence of capacity to govern just yet. So, um, you know, I, I think that they can play an important role. I'm, you know, it's not, it's not for me to, to take a position one way or the other. Um, I think that they, you know, whether, whether it's, they're able to launch a campaign that brings in enough South Africans that they believe in them or they want to see the EFF in power in a coalition, great. You know, I, I, I think, as I said, the fact that the ANC is being challenged and may get kicked out of power, you know, that could be a really good thing. Do, do you think that in the foreseeable future, something like that might happen, that the ANC may not, not just be no longer the dominant force, but may be kicked out of power? Because a lot of people that I speak with in South Africa, all over South Africa, are waiting for that moment where, the, and, and, the, where quite frankly, they're going to have to turn the page on the ANC. Well, look, we already see that in several of the major metropolitan areas, the ANC got kicked out of power, right? You know, there was a time, it seemed like everything was headed in one direction, that the ANC was going to be hegemonic. But um, already it's the case that, you know, the Western Cape province, you know, very important province, the ANC has been out of power. Several of the major cities, um, the ANC is out of power. And every election since 2004, the ANC has been losing vote share. And I think people are really focused on these questions about corruption, about economic growth and jobs. I do think, I personally think that Ramaphosa is a really great correction to, to Zuma. Um, I actually think that he's governed pretty well under COVID. So we'll see how the voters decide. So I, I don't think I'm going to make any any predictions that in 2024 the ANC will be out of power. But they only got you know a little over 50 percent of the vote in this last election. So for sure, it's you know it's within reason. And again, this is why I think um, you know this is what's great about South African democracy. It's really competitive today. I, I want to stay in South Africa a little bit before we move to other parts of Africa. Um, and I want to go to, straight to a question by Andre Maruya before going back to some of the things that I consider to be the big um, uh, uh, talking points uh, currently on the continent. You know, Andre Maruya is asking, um, well, actually, he's stating South Africa is said to practice true democracy, but that it's not really seen to be true among its youth population and across the political spectrum in Africa as a whole. And then he says, my question is, how do we address the issue of youth incisiveness in African politics? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a really it's a great question. Um, you know, one of the issues I think, well, first of all, youth participation in politics is is a problem everywhere, right? It's a problem in the United States as well. 
Um, and I think one, one argument people have made in South Africa um, that, that I think needs to be explored further um, is whether the fact that, that this generation, which didn't participate in the anti-apartheid movement and kind of has been you know, born into this system doesn't necessarily appreciate it the same way that older, older generations do. Um, and, you know, I think youth are participating in certain ways. You know, when we talk about democratic participation, it's not simply casting votes, it's talking, it's thinking, it's criticizing. Um, you know, the South African youth have been incredibly important in, um, you know, challenging uh, uh, the, the, the perpetuation of certain institutions of white supremacy with the roads must fall protests, with fees must fall protests um, and, and getting active on education and other issues. So I think that they are, they are participating in South Africa's democracy. And, you know, for the most part, the government is, you know, not clamping down on them, right? It's not as if they're shutting down their internet accounts or, or anything like that. They're, it's a, they're protecting their rights to be engaged. Um, I'm surprised that there wasn't more turnout from youth in the last election because of Malema, because I think he does inspire them. Um, so, so I think it's important. I think that, that you know, young people just need to continue to be educated about how important their, their votes are, right? You know, in a system like this, if they want to have the leaders that they think most represent their interests, they can't say on election day, ah, you know, who cares, right? Because who, who cares is a vote for the other, the other candidate. They need to, they need to participate. Yeah, one of the uh, the the the, the um, people that you mentioned in the earlier part of the webinar is your fellow MIT professor Daron Asimoglu, and I remember reading his book, their book that he wrote with James Robinson, uh, "Why um, Nations Fail." When I was a student at MIT, and that was more than a decade ago, and 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 one of the chapters, obviously, that a lot of my friends kind of discuss was that chapter, "Why is Africa Poor." And, and then, you know, because I want to go to the link between the economy and, 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 and political um, advancement. And one of the things that they, that they mention is, um, you know, not just authoritarianism and, and what we know to be um, pretty much some of the subsets of, of, of kind of major ruling forces across Africa, but the fact that um, the lack of institutions has made it easier for people to rely on tribalism in order to uh, seize power and to keep power and to change term limits and so on. And, and so, you know, when you look at the very complex tribal dynamics uh, across Africa, what have you noticed in your research? Uh, because, you know, as you know, in my country, Togo, for many years, voting was very much along kind of ethnic lines and tribal lines. And, and so what do, you, what do you see now with the youth, go back to the previous question, do you think that this is something that might change with education, with access to the internet that you mentioned earlier? Uh, or do you think that often the uh, tribal divide could still be a defining force in African politics for years to come? Yeah, I, I think it's a great point and it's definitely changing, right? So first of all, not just for the youth, but for older people, there's a stronger sense of national identities in Africa than there once was, right? You know, one of, one of the big uh, uh, conundrum at the, you know, in the early years of post-independence post Africa was, you know, you have these arbitrary borders that carved out these countries, which mix together different groups and divide certain groups. And of course that was, you know, it was really, challenging to develop governments that consolidated these people who varied across linguistic, religious, and tribal lines. Um, but more and more on surveys and other ways, a lot of political scientists, for instance, have been noticing, hey, you know, a sense of Kenyanness, Tanzanianness, Togoness is, is ticking upward, right? Um, and that's suggesting, to, at least to a certain extent, all right, that there's, there's some common sense of us and it's not just us and them across, across these tribal lines. 
Um, and clearly the, the ways in which people communicate on social media, right? Who lives in your immediate neighborhood who may be more likely to be a co-ethnic is much less important, right? Than how your interests align, the, your sorts of interests, economically, socially, politically. Um, and I think there's higher rates of intermarriage um, and, and that kind of mixing clearly begins to blur tribal lines. So, you know, it's not over yet, right? There's obviously a lot of ethnic-based voting and violence um, in large parts of, of Africa and, and politics, you know, who people vote for, you know, even in South Africa, right? Zuma had a lot of his support from a, a Zulu base in KwaZulu-Natal. Yes. Um, but the question in terms of trends, I think it's definitely changing. Yeah, um, uh, you know, Darana Asimoglu made a, a few really good points, but you know, one of my friends actually, Dambisa Moyo, who I was so glad that you mentioned her book, Edge of Chaos, in your presentation, she was, um, she's often very controversial. And, and, and you know, one of the things that she talks about obviously is these tribal allegiances. And, and one of the uh, corollaries of that is that a lot of voters or potential voters are just poorly informed. They just don't know, they don't have access to information in the way that we would think they would given the you know, newspapers that you mentioned or the websites, or the radio stations. And then so she was controversial because she said, well, we might as well just give more voting power to the educated. And, and a lot of people felt, really? And I thought about it and I'm wondering how somebody like you would feel about this kind of weighted voting system, which you know, might, potentially help to solve some of Africa's problems? Yeah, you know, I think um, on the one hand, for sure, information is important for making good decisions, right? Um, but the poor, the uneducated, they can be informed, right? There's lots of ways um, to inform them and their interests are different. You know, people who, who've enjoyed high levels of education you know, to date tend to also be wealthier, they tend to have more land. And, you know, most African countries as it is are already pretty unequal places. Well, you know, if, if we give them more power, we're likely to see more inequality. And, you know, in, in, inequality has, has, has so many negative consequences. Um, and is a, is a, you know, is both unjust and, 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 and perpetuates its own sets of problems. So um, it doesn't mean that people always vote in their own interests. Um, so, you know, I think on, on, on balance, that wouldn't be something that, that I would favor, um, you know, on, on all sorts of grounds and including an, an indignity ground. You know, I just think that, that all people deserve to be recognize and to be heard and just that that process I mean what's so amazing and I went to South Africa which is such an unequal place right you know it's hard to imagine anywhere for those of you who may not have been where you can within a relatively small geographic space see people who live so well and some who live so poorly but on voting day you know everyone's doing the same thing. They're getting on the same kinds of lines and they participate in this one act. And it's, it's an amazingly leveling uh, uh, event. And, and so I think that's important and I, and I wouldn't want to in any way see a, a weighting of unequal human worth if we do value all humans equally. That kind of feels like the right answer. Um, but you know, because I said that we were gonna link the economy with, with um, the potential for uh, political reform and political progress and political advancement. One of the things that Dambi Samoyo, who's actually Zambian, so she, you know, she's, she's again uh, out there in a lot of those issues, you know, she, she, she strongly believes that, and she wrote this in her book, Edge of Chaos, that economic growth is a prerequisite for democracy and not the other way around. And I mean, you and I, we've talked about economic growth and how that, that kind of might lead to democracy or not. What have you found in, in your research, specifically in a country like South Africa? Well, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I think that first of all, South Africa is a country that's already pretty well industrialized. I don't think that growth is a prerequisite from this 
standpoint in order to have democracy because the South Africa's problem is vast inequality. Um, and unfortunately, again, as we've seen in the United States and large parts of the world, economic growth in highly unequal societies is associated with unequal gains. Um, it doesn't have to be that way, but it does when elites get to control all of the power. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think particularly for middle and upper middle income countries like, like in South Africa, I don't think it's the right move to say, wait, you know, democracy is kind of a luxury. We should spend 10 or 20 years focusing on growth first. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's in, in here where I would, you know, agree with Jeff Sachs. I think what South Africa needs to do is continue to focus on human capital development, right? Edu you know, if, I, if I've shown you data on changes in school enrollment, you would see great changes in South Africa since the end of apartheid. Unfortunately, what those data don't reveal, but we all know, is that the quality of education is very unequal. That needs to improve, right? So education needs to improve people's health and access to services. The, the, the trends that we've begun to see, I think, need to, need to continue. Um, but, you know, Growth's important. People want prosperity. We all we all like to live a, of a good life. But I think that that we should think about what's the point. Um, and and I think the point is for people to achieve kind of a reasonable standard of living and to be able to realize their potential as humans. And that's what we need to focus on, not not growth. Yeah, one of the things that Jeffrey Sachs said in his webinar about a month and a half ago, which a lot of people did not like, uh, was he kind of looked at the Chinese model. And, 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 and almost kind of advocated for perhaps more Chinese influence in economic growth um, and, and you know, leading to economic growth in Africa. And David Lincoln Ross, uh, one of our participants is saying that he's interested in hearing from both, um, uh, for really about the growing influence of China across Africa. We, we get so many questions about that, the, the, that Sachs presentation. And then and, and David Lincoln Ross is saying, well, from billions loan or invest in an infrastructure, agricultural, um, uh, services industry to potential Atlantic harbors for its expanding global naval ambitions, this autocratic Chinese regime casts a long shadow over the continent. What are your impressions on, you know, in, on these outlooks? Look, it's, it's, it's clearly a hugely important influence uh, that the Chinese are having a huge influence in so many African countries. Uh, it, it's been met by citizens with, with varied kinds of receptions from welcoming to protest and, and anger. Um, and I think, the, again, I think the important thing, this is again why I would emphasize the importance of democracy is that on the one hand, when a small elite gets to control the decision-making insulated from the rest of the country, in some ways they can offer the tickets of access to natural resources and to you know, whatever African countries you know, might have on offer and capture all the benefits for themselves. Um, whereas if African states individually or, or perhaps you know, in regional coordination can negotiate um, you know, on their own terms as, as, as sovereign countries and, and, and sovereign subregions, you know, great, if China wants to invest and wants to, to purchase things and, and engage in trade or exchange of some kind, you know, that can very much be to, to Africa's benefit, but they need to do it while protecting the, the, the rights and property rights and future opportunities for their own people. Well, thanks, Evan. I mean, we have a lot of questions, but I'm, I'm going to squeeze one final question before I ask my final question. I'm going to squeeze that question from Rodney Charles. In. And again, speaking of national sovereignty, he's saying, well, concerning, um, concerning arms and the military, how much does a lack of a nuclear deterrent impact international trade, control of local resources um, and um, the national economy and by definition, the stability of an African democracy? Well, you know, I, I'd be lying if I said, I've thought a lot about, about that particular question. I mean, I, I, it's, it's not clear to me that African countries, let alone South Africa, would be would would really be at some kind of strategic advantage negotiating with uh, nuclear armaments uh, in in the background. I mean, I think at the very least, we still uh, 
you know, I, I would I would hate to think that that's that needs to be the basis for for uh, trade and investment negotiations um, almost anywhere, um, and and I, I haven't seen that that come up um, as a as a as a key strategic consideration. So I'm I'm willing to think about it, but but you know I think that that the the South Africans who relinquished uh, nukes and others, you know, I I, I don't I don't see. Um, as, a, as a reasonable recommendation that any African should be pursuing nukes to be for strategic advantage in trade or investment. Great. Okay. Well, I'm giving you one minute to give us three book recommendations because this is always the final question. Um, what three books would you recommend to this audience of, of African optimists and non-Africans who love Africa? All right. Claude, so you know, I've I've watched other speakers stumble on this question, so I was ready for you. <laughs> Wonderful. And so, and so, so I have for you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Three, not three, not four books. <laughs> three, three published books. You know, I I, I I had to pitch my own own book coming out in a year until we won our liberty, which which will will draw on the themes I talked about today. But you know, three great books. Um, the first. Um, you know, a novel that reflects so beautifully on the Biafran uh, uh, Civil War, Half of a Yellow Sun um, uh, uh, on Nigeria. Um, uh, the other two are about South Africa. One, Johnny Steinberg, uh, you know, it's a, he's a, a journalist slash social scientist who, who talks about a tale of, of someone considering whether they should um, get, get tested and get on antiretrovirals uh, during the, the height of the AIDS pandemic. Um, and Jacob Domini, who's a, uh, a South African now, a history professor at, um, at Princeton, um, and it's a great book, talking about some of the, the kind of strange ways in which, um, and, and drawing on some of the themes I talked about today, Black South Africans actually have some positive memories of what their lives were like under apartheid and that we need to kind of reconcile those or and think about them more deeply. And, um, so those are three great books that that I'm happy to recommend. Yours is forthcoming next year. So we will recommend that and promote it when it comes out. And this Thank leads you. us to the end of the very, very end of our a 13, uh, 11 week um, webinar series where we've had uh, 13 different speakers. I want to thank everybody from MIT, I want to start by thanking you, Evan, and all the other speakers. I want to thank MIT CIS, MIT Africa. I want to thank John Terman, Dick Samuels, Michelle English, Ari Jakubowicz, Laura Kerwin, and my own True Africa University team. Again, our website is trueafricauniversity.com. And that's Francois-Xavier Hubelon, Alain Botoko, uh, Stephanie Assari, Richard Foley, and by yet Aldi and many, many other people who've contributed to making this dream a reality. Thank you and stay tuned. We have a lot more masterclasses, webinars, and materials coming on trueafricauniversity.com. It's been a pleasure. Bye. <laughs>